The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Canada has a king for the first time in seven decades. Tonight, we'll assess what Charles III means for this province and country. Then, amid economic turmoil, why farmers want you buying local, and a new think tank wants more people thinking about monopolies. It's Tuesday, September 13th, and that's all tonight on The Agenda. While Britain and the Commonwealth mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth last week, the potentially seismic shift of a new king is also underway. Let's explore that with Philippe Lagasse, Associate Professor of International Affairs at Carleton University and an expert on the Crown. He joins us from our nation's capital. And here in our studio, Delia Opikokiu, writer and lawyer who was the first Indigenous woman called to the bar in Ontario and royal historian and author Carolyn Harris. And we're delighted to have you three with us, uh, both here in the studio and Philippe in our nation's capital. And that's where we're going to start today. Philippe, maybe you could tell us what kind of plan did the Canadian government have in place for how it would deal with the passing of the Queen? Because we know they obviously had a plan in place. Yes, uh, Steve, uh, you'll see uh, there's a, a manual that dates from the 1960s, uh, the Manual on Official Procedure and Practice, that laid out a lot of this. So the plans have been in place for some time. Uh, th what the current government did, though, was a slight variation on that to keep it updated with the times. So, for instance, uh, uh, not all members of the Privy Council were called together. It was kept to the Cabinet. We're still not quite clear on what the morning will involve in Canada. So there was a plan. It's not exactly the one that we have public access to, but it follows more or less what we saw. And I'll just note that there was one area that was a little bit different, uh, w which was the proclamations that were done in the provinces. And when there's a change in the established plan, who ultimately decides how those changes are going to come forward? So ultimately, this is something that belongs with the Prime Minister, and it's done uh, in consultation with uh, officials in, within the Privy Council office, uh, no, notably the Secretary to the Queen, I would imagine, and they come up with what they believe is the appropriate response. And if you look at that uh, manual from the 1960s, you'll see that it's, it's actually quite adamant that a lot of these decisions are discretionary, and they ultimately rest with the Prime Minister. Gotcha. Carolyn, let me follow up with you in as much as... Uh, it, when the plan maybe changes a little bit, mm -hmm. as you look, is there anything sort of unexpected or distinctive or unusual that you've seen over the last few days that you hadn't anticipated? Well, something that very much stands out in 2022 compared to 1952 is the involvement of the Governor General, uh, Mary Simon. As 70 years ago, when King George VI passed away on the 6th of February, 1952, um, Canada's Governor General, the last British-born Governor General, Viscount Alexander, had been summoned back to the United Kingdom to be Prime Minister Winston Churchill's Defence Minister. But the first Canadian-born Governor General Vincent Massey had not yet taken office, and he wouldn't until the 19th of February. So it was the administrator in Canada who made the proclamation of the new Queen Elizabeth II. Whereas it's different in 2022, we have Governor General Mary Simon, and she first met the Queen over a video conferencing, and then was there for the Platinum Jubilee. So already had this working relationship uh, with the Queen. Something else that stands out in 2022 is the very emotional speech by the Prime Minister as he's known the Queen since he was a child, as his father, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, was also Prime Minister. And so he was able to speak of this very lifelong connection mm. to the Queen and to the monarchies. So there's been some very very touching speeches by, the, by those who've known the Queen over the course of her reign. And let me bring it down to the province of Ontario, because uh, many people mm -hmm. would have seen yesterday that Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowd well, mm -hmm. the royal representative mm -hmm. here in the province of Ontario and Premier Ford held mm -hmm. a ceremony. Mm -hmm. 
Would that have happened in 1952 with then Premier Leslie Frost and whoever the GG of the day was? Now that would or not, LG, I, sh I should say. <laughs> now that would not have been the case in 1952. We're seeing this extended um, involvement uh, by the provinces in terms of the royal proclamation. Certainly, uh, the, the Queen was uh, proclaimed uh, in uh, Ontario, but the degree to which that we're seeing the provinces and their involvement in these ceremonies, that, that very much stands out. Gotcha. Delia, uh, we obviously wanted you here today because we want a better understanding of how uh, people in the Indigenous world are reacting to the Queen's death. What does it mean to you and your colleagues? Uh, what it means to me uh, and my colleagues is that uh, uh, there is an emotional feeling about Queen Elizabeth passing. Uh, she was uh, honoured many times by Indigenous people and she represents the uh, uh, the uh, crown in respect of the signing of the treaties because uh, e each of the treaties were signed on behalf of whatever their majesty was uh, in place at the time and so the leading words for the treaties is the uh, is, is the particular uh, the particular name like for instance Queen Victoria or, or Prince Edward mm -hmm. uh, with a number of treaties in the uh, 19 and uh, 19th century and the 20th centuries and so especially the elders take the personally the fact that they consider the crown uh, the the human being themselves being responsible for enforcing the treaties the younger people had different do have different feelings many of them uh, look at the colonialism as being a bad thing of course mm. uh, and the fact that the uh, creation of the uh, of the uh, Indian residential schools was uh, created under the uh, Indian Act which is uh, a legislation that would have been passed uh, under the crown uh, and which took power away from first, uh, from indigenous people over the education of their children and also enforced the uh, not only the assimilation but the attempts to uh, destroy the culture and, uh, and language just looking at my social media that that reaction is very strong among younger people and and so their uh, feelings are that uh, yeah she died but she didn't do enough among younger people whereas older people especially those that have passed on behind be before me because I was very active in the 60s and the 70s where some of the people that had signed the treaties were still alive really believed in the crown really believed now, in the just crown. just let me follow up quickly when, when you when you convey their feelings that the Queen quote unquote didn't do enough didn't do enough of what? Didn't do enough to enforce the treaties uh, and protect them from the uh, fact that their treaties were breached. Understood. Okay. Philippe, how is the Queen's death affecting the operations, the day-to-day -day operations of both federal and provincial governments in the country? Well, effectively, in a formal sense, it isn't. Uh, once the Queen uh, passed, Charles automatically became king. Uh, and the le there's legal continuity in government uh, across her realms, which means that Charles simply becomes the legal personality that the Queen was previously. Now, that's formally speaking, of course. Now, when we look at the fact that there's a great deal of effort that's being put into holding uh, various ceremonies and having officials attend various events, then we can see that it's going to have a short-term impact. But in terms of the long-term impact, uh, there is no change uh, in any formal oaths or, or contracts that are required or any laws. Uh, the legal personality of the Crown remains the same. And let me just uh, follow up on that because uh, obviously every cabinet minister in the province of Ontario or federally or anywhere, I guess, in the country, they swear an oath to the Queen when they're sworn in. Well, th the Queen is no longer with us. Do they need to be sworn in again? No, they don't. So for two reasons. First, uh, the, many of the O's include references to her heirs and successors, which covers that over. But as well, it is understood that the oath, particularly in a Canadian context, and as you, your viewers may know, it was uh, the citizenship oath was challenged on a number of occasions. Uh, and the rulings indicated that what you're swearing an oath to is either the queen and her legal personality, therefore the crown and its enduring timeless legal personality, or the Canadian system overall. So there, there is no need to re retake these oaths. 
though uh, some parliamentarians uh, may choose to do so, and similarly, some uh, cabinet ministers may choose to do so. Well, let me follow up, Carolyn, with you on the issue of the succession plan. Uh, we, we talked a moment ago about the fact that the lieutenant governor and the premier of today, mm -hmm. Doug Ford, did something that mm -hmm. would not have happened 70 years ago. How did the provinces somehow get into the act that they felt they needed to do this official succession plan, which had not previously existed? Well, I think it's just because of the significance of this moment. It's been 70 years since there has been a change in reign. And so few people can remember 1952 and King George VI. So I think that the significance of the occasion is very clear. We're never again going to see a 70-year reign of this kind. And also, it's a statement of support for the new king, uh, Charles III, over the years of many people who've wondered if he would have the same degree of support that his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, had. And all of these statements, you know, from the provinces as well as the federal government, that although the succession is automatic, all of these uh, proclamations indicate there, there being you know, widespread support at the official level for the new king. Well, let me pick up on that issue of support, Delia, because um, certainly in the immediate days after the Queen's death, there has been a great outpouring of emotion, loyalty, warm feelings towards Her Majesty. But we know that eh, perhaps not in the too distant future, there are going to be increasing voices on the issue of whether we still want the monarchy in Canada. And I'd like your view on that. Do you think this is an opportunity for Canada to consider being a republic as opposed to a constitutional monarchy. Oh, there's a small opportunity for uh, it to be considered uh, for Canada to be a republic. But the reality is that I don't think it's uh, going to happen. I'm of the age when uh, the uh, constitutional conferences took place in the 80s, and people were tired of it by the end of that, that era. And uh, it would require 100% uh, approval from uh, each of the provinces and the federal government for the uh, for the change to be made from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. I don't think we'll have that because I think each uh, in each case, like it did occur with uh, with Mitch Lake, there would have to be a referendum, and that's a huge process. The federal government and the 10 provinces can't agree that the sky is blue to lay yes, today, yeah. let alone agree on whether yeah, it yeah. changed fundamentally the way we govern ourselves. Y yes. Okay. But and in your heart, would you like to see the absence of the monarchy in our system of government? In my heart, uh, I look at it for, not so much from my... Uh, uh, soft heart, but my hard heart as a lawyer, ah, okay. <laughs> because of the Constitution Act of 1982 in respect of uh, my people, the treaty uh, rights and uh, Aboriginal rights, they're entrenched in the Constitution Act of 1982, which means that in a certain way the Crown, uh, 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 King Charles, is symbolic. So whether he, he, he were no longer uh, the King of England, it would continue. Uh, the, the responsibility that Canada has a state uh, to enforce and protect uh, the Aboriginal treaty rights. The group that I am most happy about from that perspective is the Supreme Court of Canada, because after the 92 Act, okay, this was the first time that case law started to be established that the uh, the uh, Crown and Right of Canada had a duty to enforce and to protect treaty rights. Hmm. Understood. And so as long as the Supreme Court continues, I'm happy. You're happy then. Philippe, this may be a good opportunity to do a little uh, Monarchy Civics 101. Uh, the public obviously has an understanding that uh, monarchs attend events, they open bridges, they contribute to charitable organizations, but they also have uh, direct responsibilities as it relates to the governing of uh, certainly the United Kingdom and their representatives beyond in the Commonwealth. What do those responsibilities involve? Help us out there. Right, so let's break it apart. First, what is the crown? The crown is our concept of the state. It, uh, it's what provides sovereign authority, whether it be uh, the crown and council, which is the executive power, the crown and parliament, which is the legislative power, or the crown and the courts, which upholds uh, the, the king's peace. So even the crown itself ultimately uh, even if we were to try to replace it, we would have to replace it with some other concept of the state. 
Now, when it comes to the person that holds the office of sovereign or their representatives, uh, whether at the federal level or in the provinces, they have a number of what are called reserve powers. And these are understood to be personal prerogatives that they can exercise to uphold the Constitution or fulfill their duties. Most notably in the Canadian Constitution, the king is limited to two real powers here. The first is the appointment or dismissal of the governor general. And as you might recall from uh, Julie Payette's time as governor general, there was some discussion about whether or not the queen might have to exercise her personal prerogative to dismiss a governor general. And the second one is section 26 of the Constitution Act 1867, which has a dual key system effectively for uh, the naming of additional senators, where the queen or the king and the governor general need to sign off on that decision. Now, uh, other than that, we're talking about the, the appointing of first ministers, although there's really not much discretion there left anymore. Uh, and the one area where there probably is some discretion, as we saw in, in BC in 2017, is the ability of vice regal representatives to decline a request to dissolve the legislatures and to invite a new government to, uh, to take power. So those are really the, the limited areas. Now, I remember from school learning about the powers of reservation and disallowance, meaning that if a governor general or a lieutenant governor uh, thought that a law that had been passed by the House of Commons approved in the Senate, uh, that they didn't like it, they could refuse to sign it and in, in effect prevent that law from, from happening. Are those powers still on the books, number one? And number two, can you imagine any Queen's representative actually using those, or King's representative now, forgive me, using those powers nowadays? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Steve, because if you look at the, the federal provision, it refers to the Queen in Council. So the Governor General would reserve or disallow on, uh, on the advice of the, the Queen's Council, which at the time, in 1867, would have referred to the British Cabinet. So even though it's still in the books, it seems unlikely that the British Cabinet would uh, ask the Governor General to either reserve or disallow a Canadian act or a Canadian bill, as it were. Federally, it gets a little bit more complicated because you might make the argument, and I, I do know some people who would say, look, uh, the federal government should still have the ability to reserve or disallow provincial legislation, which is deeply offensive to the Constitution. My own view uh, is that it's probably a spent power, and it would be a crisis if that ever occurred. And by the same token, uh, left Tenant governors in the past have seemed to exercise these powers of their own volition, <laughs> uh, which is highly problematic. And finally, just to end, there has been some talk uh, of whether or not they can deny royal assent, so leaving aside a reservation and disallowance, can they simply refuse to sign a bill uh, of their own accord? Uh, and that, I would argue, is uh, only for the most extreme of circumstances and should never be discussed as uh, a reserve power that would be used lightly. Understood. Let's, uh, you know what, Sheldon, middle of page two, let's bring up this graphic here because I would, um, let's share some polling numbers here. What kind of a task does King Charles III have ahead for him? Because uh, Angus Reid did a survey, this was back in April, mind you. Now, five months ago, 51% of Canadians surveyed said the country should not remain a monarchy. The survey found that while 55% of Canadians supported remaining a constitutional monarchy for as long as the Queen is alive, support for Charles and Camilla dropped to 34%. So this is the task at hand, uh, Carolyn, for the new monarch. He needs to, I guess, establish in the public's mind mm -hmm. uh, that he can do the job. Yes, right now there's a big outpouring of sympathy because King Charles III has just lost his mother. He lost his father, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh last year. So we're seeing the cheering crowds outside of Buckingham Palace, expressions of sympathy from around the world. But once he settles into the job, there's going to be a lot of critical scrutiny. And it's a similar moment in some ways to 1901 when Queen Victoria passed away. And many people simply could not imagine Imagine her son Edward the seventh who was 59 and that seemed like a great age at that time stepping into that role and he managed to exceed expectations and carved out a role for himself as a diplomat on the European stage and the new King Charles the third has emphasized that he wants to be everyone's king the Commonwealth realms the nations within the United Kingdom the overseas territories people of all faiths all walks of life and he's emphasized from day 
one making himself visible, greeting the crowds immediately, uh, there being cameras there uh, for the accession council in his first meeting uh, with British Prime Minister Liz Truss. So we're seeing this very strong emphasis on making the crown, the monarchy, and these royal duties accessible uh, to the public from very early on. But Delia, I mean, clearly these numbers show, and admittedly these numbers are before the Queen's death, but these numbers show that uh, King Charles III has a job ahead of him if he intends to get more of the public uh, to embrace his monarchy. Would you agree with that interpretation? I certainly agree with that interpretation that he needs to do more. And uh, one of the things that I've been upset about is the fact that uh, uh, the treatment, uh, particularly by the media, of uh, the Duchess of Sussex, Sussex uh, Meghan Markle. Because from my perspective, as a woman of color, I thought that would bring diversity and inclusion uh, into the monarchy. Uh, for those of us who are not uh, Anglo-Saxon, who don't have a history from that, uh, uh, we somehow feel, in a way, excluded. And the fact that she was included, a woman of mm -hmm. color, a woman uh, biracial, uh, and just not being treated so well. I would feel that the uh, prince would learn uh, more about reconciliation, that forgiveness is important if he feels that uh, she hurt uh, them in any way because she would be so important to the crown. For people like me to have a greater respect to, of the crown. We've got just a few minutes left here, and let's see if we can touch on a couple of more things. Carolyn, we keep hearing the new king saying he wants a slimmed-down royal family. What does that mean? Yes, when the Queen succeeded to the throne in 1952, she brought in her extended family to undertake public engagements, including independence ceremonies around the world as decolonization unfolded. The Queen's cousins were involved in this process. Whereas right now we see there's seven working members of the royal family, the new King and Queen consort, William and Catherine, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, Princess Anne, and Prince Edward and Sophie, the Earl and Countess of Wessex. So there's going to be a very heavy workload uh, for those seven members of the royal family at this time, whereas the previous reign, there was a more expansive idea of who should be brought in to uh, perform royal duties. And Philippe, the, uh, well, the royal family in some respects is a lot like most families in as much as there is dysfunction, there are feuds, there are harmed feelings. Um, Maybe unlike some other families, there are allegations, as Dealey just said, of racism. There's criticism of Britain's legacy. What do you expect from King Charles III in terms of dealing with all of that? Well, to Carolyn's point, I think he's going to make a concerted effort to try and shore up these areas of criticism. So I don't expect that Prince Andrew will be at all brought back into the fold, for instance. I expect that a lot of the criticism that surrounds uh, the king already in terms of royal finances will be dealt with by trying to rein in spending. The sovereign grant has been providing uh, the crown with greater and greater funds every year. And that's that's hard to, to justify at a time when austerity is coming in and, and inflation and the cost of living are, are making life in the UK particularly difficult. So he does have a daunting task ahead of him, not only in terms of the image of the family, but even the image of the institution. And uh, just going back to those polling numbers for a second, these this is an institution that's waxed and waned. And I wouldn't necessarily uh, assume that because the Queen uh, was incredibly popular, that the institution will fare as well under Charles, particularly, as uh, was said, his conduct and his approach to the role will be uh, really carefully scrutinized. Indeed. Uh, Dealey, let me give you the last word. Um, we obviously don't know how long Charles is going to be the king, obviously not as long as his mother was the queen, but would you bet on him being a good king? Well, there's one highlight that I uh, have respect for him on his uh, work on environment and the fact that he has made some uh, very important statements uh, related to the protection of the land, the environment, the animals, uh, which is uh, sacred to indigenous people. Protecting the land is important. And I understand from one of the news, story, law, uh, news stories that he di did give the example about how uh, working with indigenous people in the context of climate change is uh, valuable. And he was there decades before most people. Yes, he so was. So that, that argues well. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, in our studio here, Carolyn Harris, Delia OPECQ, Philip Legacy in the nation's capital. Really glad all of you could join us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Buy local took on new meaning during the pandemic as people became more aware of supply chains and where things we buy come from. Farmers, not surprisingly, would like to add their voices to that chorus. Stephanie Klustra farms at Copperwood Acres, and she joins us now from Campbellford, just east of Peterborough, to make the case for buying meat, dairy, and produce straight from small farmers across Ontario. Stephanie, it's great to meet you. Thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Thanks for having me. How's life on the farm? As always, it is busy, but I'm happy to make the time for such an important issue. Very kind of you. Uh, let's just find out a bit about you. What kind of, uh, kind of animals have you got there? I, I have the whole menagerie here. Uh, we raise cattle mainly for beef, but this summer I have also raised 250 meat chickens. We have egg layers for our family and for our friends, of course. We always have, have extra. I have ducks and geese and pretty much anything else. Oh, and rabbits. Sometimes I forget what I have. It's that many. <laughs> uh, and I have two small children under the age of three, so it is busy as life gets, but it is the best kind of busy. So all of those animals and two kids under three, so not much going on in your neck of the woods, right? No, lots of nap time happening here. Yeah, I can see. Now, with the, with the okay, the, the, the cattle, the beef, the chickens, the eggs, I get all that. The ducks and the geese and the rabbits, do you get, do you get product out of that? Uh, the rabbits are product that I plan to sell. They're going to the butcher this month. Um, the geese was more just a dream for me to fulfill as far as my fly away home, you know, childhood dream. And they are slowly becoming an annoyance. So they may just be Christmas dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I've seen you on Tic Tac, I gotta say, and, um, you're really good. And I think we should share how good you are with the people who are watching and listening to us right now. So stand by, Stephanie and Sheldon, if you would. TikTok, please. <laughs> Hello, fellow Ontarians. Inflation is hitting hard and large chain grocery stores are having to cut corners and sacrifice quality on a daily basis. But you wanna know where that is not happening? Small farms across Ontario. My farm, Copperwood Acres, is located conveniently between Camelford and Havelock, Ontario, and I am able to make deliveries within an hour of where I'm located. I am also available non-stop, because farmers never sleep, for pickup here at the farm. What I can offer is quality pasture-raised meat that tastes better than anything you have tasted and purchased at the grocery store previously. You are terrific, I gotta say. Yeah, the camera really loves you. Great job there. Uh, but make, make the case here. Why do you think people should buy their meat from small farms? Uh, because we really need it. Um, and I mean, like, not to sound uh, like I, it's all about me, but it's all about the small farm right now, buying local, supporting local, and making sure your money stays local. And if we don't get more support now, these small farms are slowly going to start disappearing. And in order to offer quality meat that is, um, I like to say, ethically raised, we are raising this meat for our own families. It's really important to make sure you're supporting that in any way that you can, whether it be on social media, because I'm not the only one that is doing this now, or whether it be by actually purchasing our products. What generation farmer are you? <laughs> it's weird. I'm actually a first generation farmer. My husband hmm. and I have only been doing this three years. I was always a true believer that if you build it, they will come. Um, but it's actually the most difficult part is getting people to come out to my small farm and purchase what we are building and what we are creating and what we have available. Well, I'm sure you knew how tall a mountain it would be to climb to be a successful small farmer in the province of Ontario today. So why are you doing it? Uh, well, it's really just about my family. like. It's been the goal to have something where we can raise our own food and eat something that is healthy, and I know exactly what is going into it. However, with having my second daughter, the opportunity arose, because I am in Ontario and I am on maternity leave, that I can raise enough meat to try to sell it and actually start doing this full time. Um, so I guess you can say I'm taking advantage of opportunity. Technically, I'm still employed and I'm on maternity leave. Um, but I'm working really hard in the meantime to build something else that I I feel strongly is very important. What time do you get up every day? Uh, <laughs> when my daughter decides. Any <laughs> time between 5 and 6.30 and chores are usually done by 7.30 or 8. Those babies tend to be really good alarm clocks, aren't they? It's 
I will sleep when I'm dead, probably, but <laughs> it is honestly the best way to wake up. I I will miss them when they're gone. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm sure, Pe uh, look, I'm, I, I know people, uh, obviously, in their hearts would love to support you. I know they mm -hmm. care about small family farms. They don't yeah. want to see your way of life and the, and, and the business that you do disappear. But obviously, people are cost conscious today, and they want to know what your prices are like compared to if they go to the big supermarket down the street. What can you tell us? Uh, well, I can tell you that with inflation hitting every market and grocery store specifically, right now, our prices are more comparable than ever. Uh, my prices have really not been too affected at this time. So, like, I'm happy to say I'm selling my chicken at four twenty-five a pound. So my birds, depending on size, are anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars, and that can feed families as far as two or three meals because the quality of meat is just so much greater. It there's very little shrinkage. You're able to feel and taste the protein, and I've had customers come back and tell me that. When their children have not enjoyed store-bought meat, they haven't eaten it, they've been happy to ask for seconds when they've cooked my meat. So it does, you can taste the difference, and I'm happy to say my customers have told me so. Gotcha. Now, last time I went shopping at a supermarket, I think I paid like 10, 12, 13 bucks for a steak. What do you charge? Yeah. Uh, so right now my ground, uh, well, my ground beef is all sold out. Everybody jumped on it, um, but I will have more available this fall. Uh, and I do have stewing beef available. They are anywhere from a pound to a pound and a half, and it's only $8. And that is Highland beef. It is beyond anything you're going to purchase at a grocery store as far as the fat, fat content and how much you're going to get out of it. People don't need to eat as much when they're getting a higher quality and protein meat. Mm -hmm. And how about antibiotics? Yeah. Are your cattle getting that? No, my, well, so my cattle are obviously, they are va vaccinated every year. The health of my cattle are important, but my animals are pasture raised. You can come and see them out in the pasture or watch my TikToks. That's why I do what I do. I want people to be confident in the meat they're getting because they see me do my chores every day. Uh, so they're pasture raised, they're on hay, and then I do feed them grain because they are spoiled. <laughs> and I like <laughs> to feed them treats. Now, uh, given that you can't offer the kind of discounts that massive producers can provide, I mean, you're not into the kind of volumes that they're into. It, does I it Yeah. Well, does it necessarily <laughs> go without saying that your produce is going to be a little more expensive than what people would get in the supermarket? Yeah, it is. Um, that is, I, I like to say that is fact. I can't compete with, they, they call them loss leaders for a reason, especially the cooked chickens that you buy in Costco. Specifically, you have to walk to the back to get them, but they're cheap, right? Mm -hmm. What did you grab on the way? You never get out of Costco with less than $100. Um, I can't offer that being a small business and it is going to be more expensive, but I want to say that it's going to make a huge difference and a huge impact on your life if you're a customer of mine, not only for the health of you and your family, um, like physically, your health will be better eating a meat that is raised ethically and on grass and, and on pasture. Um, it's also going to do a world of difference to your mental health. Like you come here and you see my children, they welcome you, they give you my products because they, I can't do anything without their health. Um, and I have to think that that does something for my customers as well. They I, feel like they've helped. I think and, you're exactly right about that. Getting out of the big city and getting, yeah. uh, you know, into the country and seeing, the, seeing the oh, it's fantastic. No question. Yeah. What about, um, what about, okay, so chicken and beef, I understand the benefits that you talked about there. What about your dairy pr uh, products? Uh, similar benefits? Uh, well, so definitely um, dairy is a whole different ball game and I don't, personally do dairy at the moment, but I have my daughter on goat's milk and goat's milk is something that you can purchase more from small farms. There's not as many restrictions around it and it is actually easy, more easily digestible. So there are a lot of alternatives that you can purchase from small farms. Um, definitely look into those options as well as um, just like Taking a look at who's in your area and who is offering stuff locally, especially on classified and Facebook ads. Now, I got to know more about that. I must confess, I don't know that I've ever had goat's milk before. How does it taste different from regular milk? 
Uh, well, there's definitely a taste difference. It's all in it's all in how it's been pasteurized. In my understanding, it doesn't need to any additional pasteurization. I'm not a an expert on it, um, but it has made a world of difference in my daughter. She was having rabbit poops. She's eight, uh, sorry, 15 months old, and she was having rabbit poops for a long time. And I've switched her over to goat's milk, and she is running like a tap now. I would say she's running <laughs> just how she should. Um, it does taste different, uh, but it's something that you have to like really shake it up and, and make sure it's all been uh, properly shook, I find, and then it tastes just fine. I gotcha. like it. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, talk to us about convenience, because you know that a lot of people just go to the supermarket down the street because it's easy and you can park there, et cetera, et cetera, whereas you're going to yeah. be a bit of a drive. What's the argument oh. then for going to you? For sure. Um, I mean, my argument is that you just have to reach out and see what your options are, because... I have two kids that love taking car rides and I visit Peterborough often and I visit um, Belleville for friends. So I like to say if you're within an hour's radius of my farm, there's a very good possibility I will be able to offer delivery. So convenience is really taken out of the equation when that comes into play. Um, and then also there's so much to be said for, like you said, coming out, taking the drive and seeing where your meat is coming from mm -hmm. and how we're doing things and, and just, becoming friends with farmers is actually pretty cool. Amen. Amen to that. Now, tell me this. When people see this, uh, you are going to be inundated by business because you've made such a good pitch here to the people of Ontario. Are you going to be able to actually, um, you know, produce enough for all of the people who are going to be banging your doors down? Okay. Personally, I will not be able to produce enough. That's already the problem. I don't have everything available and people are asking for, you know, half cows and these are options that are available through butchers and through small farms all across Ontario. So do I have enough? No, I have lots of chicken. Please get a hold of me. I can give you chicken. I'm going to have turkeys available. I have them now and I will for every holiday coming up. And I do have beef. I will have lots of beef available all year. But when it comes to these farm products, start looking on Facebook, start reaching out to people that you know that are farmers because really all you have to do is ask and be like hey do you know someone who raises sheep if you're looking for lamb etc you will find that within 20 minutes of where you live there is a small farm just like mine that has product available just like mine they aren't having as much luck or they don't know how to get started on social media and advertise but we exist and we would love it if you could save us the legwork and actually start looking for us but just to confirm, as you said a moment ago, you do deliver to within about an hour of where your place is, right? Absolutely. I am located okay. in Camelford, Ontario, and I am happy to deliver within an hour of where I live. Message me on Facebook, please. Stephanie, you're awesome. And we thank you so much for sparing some time from your daily travails at the farm to spend some time with us here on TVO tonight. You be well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Inflation helped draw attention to problems that emerge when sectors of the economy rely on just a few big companies. It can have consequences for prices. And according to a new think tank, it can mean broader problems too. Robin Chaban is co-founder and senior economist of Vivek Research. She's also co-founder and director of the newly created Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. And she joins us now on the line from the nation's capital to explain. Welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's start off with what exactly the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project is. Well, like you said, the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project, or as we call it, CAMP, is a new think tank that we have recently launched. And the goal of CAMP is to advocate for policy changes to make our economy more democratic and fair. Uh, what that means in large part is creating policies that tackle monopolies and other forms of corporate concentrated power. All right, when we talk about sort of Canada specifically, why do you think such an organization here should exist? Well, Canada has, um, I think a lot of people can acknowledge a lot of, um, I wouldn't say monopolies specifically. Another word that we like to use is oligopoly, but oligopoly represents uh, markets or firms that um, 
there's a small number of them that, that serve a market. So when you think of airlines, you think of banking, you think of telecom, these are oligopolistic markets. And they bring many of the same issues that the traditional pure monopoly does. You have these concentrations of corporate power, which leads to less choice for consumers, higher prices for consumers, and ultimately less ability for people to um, exercise autonomy and um, make decisions when they come to purchase goods and services they need every day. So you talked about some industries there, airlines, you talked about telecoms. Uh, give me some, some major players here. Who are we talking about when we talk about uh, monopolies? Right. So uh, what's interesting, and I think uh, something that Camp can really contribute to the conversation, is uh, the fact that although there are these you know, pretty popular, well-known oligopolies in Canada, there are also... Um, oligopolistic firms in other perhaps lesser known industries. Uh, something that I think is really interesting is concentration when it comes to transportation within Canada. Um, and this has some major implications when it comes to infrastructure in Canada uh, and transportation networks. So for example, um, we recently had, not too many years ago now, pre-pandemic, a uh, merger that consolidated um, the transportation networks for refrigerated trucking. And mm. this happened right before the pandemic. Um, I wonder how much better able we'd be, be able to uh, deliver vaccines at the peak of the pandemic had we had more network infrastructure that was spread amongst more players, making our network more nimble and better able to deliver this critical service to people. So it has these real world implications beyond kind of the big, uh, I, I would say more visible competition problems like again, telecom banking and uh, uh, airlines, for example. All right. Let's, you talked a little bit about sort of the democratic process here, and I'm curious to know when we talk about monopolies and olig give me the pronunciation again. Yeah. No, we're talking about oligopolies. So Oligo again, okay. uh, yeah, oligopoly is when you have a small number of players that dominate a market. Uh, monopoly is when you have one player. And in most markets in Canada, we don't have a pure monopoly, although that's not always the case. Uh, but in most cases, when we're talking about markets that lack competition, we're talking about oligopolistic markets. And again, a lot of the same problems that plague monopolies are also uh, present in markets where you have a small number of players that are offering products and, and goods. Is it bad for democracy to have such a maybe not a fair playing field? Well, yeah, of course. And I think there's a few channels to this. Uh, there's a growing body of research that's looking into the relationship between corporate concentration, corporate power, and um, political influence. So I think anecdotally, we can see this uh, sort of dynamic play out, but there's a growing body of research that's looking at this more on a, a systematic level. Um, there's also the connection of democracy and inequality. When we have societies that are unequal, where not everyone has the same ability to participate in society and exercise agency in uh, economic terms, it undermines our ability to um, create the conditions for a healthy democracy. And, and I actually look at, I think a lot about the... Uh, political turmoil that we've been seeing, you know, in Canada and around the world. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of economic roots to that problem, um, inequality in particular. So we need to be ensuring that everyone has access to the physical resources that they need in order to thrive. And economic equity and economic fairness is really important to that. Oligopolies and monopolies uh, prevent that sort of uh, fairness that we need. I, I'm curious to know, why do you think companies, and one company that comes to mind is someone like Amazon, uh, have been allowed to sort of become so large over the last decade or 15 years? Well, uh, in large part, well, large part might be a bit of an overstatement, but 
part of why this is the case is because um, policymakers have permitted it to, to be that way. Uh, what's interesting about Amazon is that um, the federal government's uh, industry committee, uh, the Parliamentary Committee on Industry, actually had a study involving Amazon almost 20 years ago now, in 2000. So at this point, Amazon was uh, a burgeoning new company. They launched in 1997, if I'm not mistaken. And Parliament was looking at this new firm thinking, hmm, like, this isn't something we've seen before. They're engaging in these business practices that are unusual. They're pretty aggressive. What does this mean for competition? And the experts that they uh, brought in to testify on this said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, Amazon, yeah, they're engaging in some of these interesting practices. Uh, bundling is one example where you sell one product really cheap, you sell another product for more, and it allows you to capture greater swaths of the market and become dominant without actually competing on the merits of, of what you're providing, like better service. So the experts that Parliament drew on said, well, you know what, it's fine. Let Amazon do this because Amazon seems to be a cool, innovative company. If we let them get big, it'll be great because everyone will benefit from this and you know, the nature of competition is such that in the long run, some new Amazon's going to come around mm -hmm. and compete this current Amazon out of business. And this is just how capitalism works. Uh, I think we can look 20 years down the road and say, ah, I don't know, were they right about that? Um, so, I, you know, a lot of it is policy decisions, and that's why the work of CAMP is so important. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the money there and the consumer aspect, and I'm sure my neighbors next door who get their Amazon packages delivered every other day uh, might say, hey, you know, Amazon size has helped it bring down its prices, and is that not a net benefit for consumers? Yeah, and this is a, this is a conundrum that... Um, the government has been grappling with for a century. And uh, that's not an exaggeration. Canada's competition law, which is a, a core uh, piece of legislation that regulates monopolies and oligopolies, was created um, prior to the 1900s. So we've had this law in the books for over a century. And when this law was first created, parliamentarians debated well, you know, if we have bigger firms, aren't they more efficient? Don't we get better production costs? I think that this is definitely an important consideration in the scheme of things. The problem is that in Canada, we prioritize these cost savings to the detriment of consumers. So for example, in the 1990s, there was a merger between two propane distribution companies, Superior Propane and ICG Propane. And the merger created literal monopolies. So one propane distribution company in 16 communities across Canada. So what that meant is for people who needed propane to heat their homes, to run their barbecues, to uh, run their business, they only had one propane company they could go to within driving distance. This merger was permitted to happen because the parties argued that it created massive cost savings. And furthermore, these cost savings, they weren't passed on to consumers. They led to higher profits. Our law is designed to permit these sorts of business activities, these sorts of mergers. Um, and so we prioritize these cost savings over the benefits of con to accrued to consumers and workers for that matter. So is it a factor to consider? Yes, but it needs to be considered in perspective. And that's what we're really lacking right now. All right, I want to talk a little bit about CAMP. Uh, given that some of the biggest monopolies are based in the US, uh, how much of an impact do you think uh, a Canadian organization can have? There are, you're right, a lot of the big monopolies that we talk about today, Google, Facebook, uh, they're based in the United States. However, because these companies operate in Canada, they do fall under Canadian law. So Canada and its legislation does have some power to address these issues. I think your question also points to a reality that 
these problems are not just national, they're global. And that's why we're seeing actually a rise in organizations like CAMP across the globe. We have organizations advocating for greater economic fairness and uh, economic democracy in the United States. We also have it in uh, organizations in the UK and other places in Europe. And we're developing a network ultimately of advocates that are pushing for um, laws that curb oligopolies and monopolies so that we have an economy that works for everyone. All right, so we talked about democracy. We talked about sort of the, the price point for consumers. One thing I think is super important and an interesting one is how monopolies affect the labor market. And I think one sort of recent example that we've talked about a little bit is sort of the, the hero pay that frontline workers in supermarkets got. Tell us a little bit about that and how that affects the labor market as well. Sure. So it's only really in the last maybe five or 10 years that policymakers concerned with issues of competition have actually turned their attention to the impact of bad, poor competition in labor markets. And this is a massive oversight because competition, oligopoly, monopoly, these issues have real impacts on workers. It reduces the ability for people to earn higher wages and also leads to reductions in the quality of work. So whether that's the hours you work, or the benefits you get from work, these sorts of things. So uh, a, a good example of the deficiencies we have in our laws and policies today is this hero pay example you brought up. Um, so in that case, grocery stores, um, Sobeys uh, was one of them, um, increased pay for workers uh, in the height of the pandemic. Uh, they then uh, had some informal conversations with each other uh, so that they effectively coordinated a cut in the hero pay. So they coordinated a reduction in the compensation for their workers, um, you know, at large. Normally, this is very illegal, but because of the way our law was structured at the time, this sort of collusion was permissible. There was nothing the Competition Bureau could do. Since then, the Liberal government has implemented um, in its recent Budget Implementation Act uh, a new provision that would make um, collusions uh, in this way criminal. However, there are many deficiencies still in the law. Um, this sort of provision isn't going to capture behaviors where you don't have a really clear paper trail, for example. And in a, case, in a reality where uh, you know things are becoming more digital, uh, it's easier than ever to just erase your paper trail and, and leave no trace of collusive agreements to suppress wages for workers. When we talk about camp, I, I'm curious, um, in terms of tangible things you guys are trying to achieve, but also what are you focusing right now on uh, in terms of your efforts? So our biggest push right now is to move the needle on reforming the Competition Act. So like I mentioned before, um, our competition laws are one of our key instruments we have today to curb excess corporate power. And there's some severe deficiencies with the law. The federal government has announced a review of the act, and we're hoping to contribute to that by providing constructive input that um, brings a consumer-focused uh, perspective while also capturing the needs of workers, small businesses, farmers, and other players in the economy beyond big business that are impacted by competition law. So that's a, a really big push for us right now. All right, uh, before we wrap, I do want to ask one question. I think that for a lot of small towns, you hear you know, the excitement around big department stores coming in. And I'm curious the impact monopolies have on sort of the characteristics of, of small towns. How does that change sort of the small town vibe? I know I, in Belleville, for example, there's lots of talk about a Costco coming, but uh, what are the impacts of that on the grounds? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's something that we touch on with Camp as well. One of our co-founders, uh, well, I'll give up to a, a shout out to our co-founders. We have Keldon Vester, who is an independent researcher and uh, an expert in telecommunications policy on our 
um, on our board. We also have Andrew Cameron, and Andrew has uh, undertaken a lot of important advocacy work on his own, looking at the impact of monopolies and corporate power on small towns. He has launched the Center, um, the Center for Small Town Success, uh, and he also has a podcast called Monopolies Killed My Hometown. And in his podcast, Andrew explores how uh, the rise of big business has changed the landscape of his town of Amherst, Nova Scotia. And his podcast is excellent if you're interested in learning more about monopoly, corporate power, and why it's important for small towns and communities. Uh, but to, to answer your question in particular, part of the problem of having big businesses come and enter these small towns and change the landscape of them is again, back to one of our core themes with camp, it removes this feeling of uh, economic agency and economic power and centralizes economic power in the large retailers that move into the community. So we lose some of these you know, important neighborhood stores and locations and people become beholden to the large retailers that exist in their town, both uh, from a consumer standpoint, but also from a worker standpoint. So it, uh, it's really important to have um, a diffusion of economic power within our communities so that everyone has the uh, agency and ability to engage in the economy on fair terms so that they can meet their their basic needs and, uh, and ultimately be fulfilled as humans. Robin, it's always great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for this and great good luck with camp. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Tomorrow on the agenda. There are all kinds of really important parts of our health system that are not publicly funded uh, because of the way that the Canada Health Act was established. So it was written uh, now the, the its 1984 version uh, decades ago. Um, its roots are more than a half a century ago, and it was done at a time when most care was delivered in hospitals and most of it was done by physicians. Now, all kinds of things that physicians previously did can be done as well or better by other parts of the health system. That's tomorrow on the agenda. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, September 13th, 2022. Tomorrow, could more private delivery of publicly insured services help Ontario patients? We'll look into that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.